smartphone jargon can be confusing. And that's exactly why we are going to simplify or oversimplify several tech jargon for you in this episode of Elemental where we talk about the smaller things in tech that make a much bigger impact on the real world. You can catch us every Sunday at 1 p.m. And if you love this series, do not forget to subscribe to our channel and hit that bell icon so that you're always notified of our latest videos. Okay, so let's start with display. As if the confusion between LCD and AMOLED panels wasn't enough, we also have FOLED panels, we have GOLED panels, we have POLED panels. So what's the confusion all about? Let's start understanding, uh, starting with LCD displays or liquid crystal displays. So these displays are basically layered, which means you have this one illuminating layer, uh, which uh, radiates a lot of light. And then you have certain other layers that are made out of liquid crystals that converge light into certain wavelengths. So you have red, green, and blue wavelengths. And then you have certain filters that further process this light. And ultimately you get to see the final picture. That's oversimplified, of course, but that's basically in a nutshell how LCD displays work. Now, these displays have really good color accuracy, but they struggle with contrast. That's because they always have this backlight. Now, that's where AMOLED displays come in. Now, AMOLED displays basically stand for Active Matrix Organic Light Emitting Diodes, which are basically put onto a substrate like glass or plastic. And that's where terms like POLED, which is plastic OLED displays or plastic AMOLED displays come into picture. Now, as I mentioned before, POLED are basically a subtype of AMOLED displays and instead of glass substrate, they use plastic substrate so they can be fit into uh, smartphones or form factors that require flexible displays and you also have FOLED displays or FOLED displays which are basically Samsung's way of saying the same thing as POLED or plastic organic light emitting diode displays. Now this makes a segue into brightness and stuff like HDR or high dynamic range. Now, if these displays weren't bright enough, you wouldn't be seeing them a lot in a really bright scenario because they have to fight the ambient light. And that's why we have this term called NITS. NITS is basically a unit of measurement of brightness, just like how you have meter while uh, you are measuring distances. So if you want to get a smartphone with a decent brightness on the display, you may want to go something with like 600 or 700 nits. Now let's talk about HDR displays or HDR10 and HDR10 plus displays. HDR stands for high dynamic range and as we know from mathematics, range stands for anything, any difference from the lowest and the highest value. Now if you want a good display that shows you things that are close to life or even better than life, you may want it to show you uh, the blackest of blacks and the brightest of whites. You want it to show you uh, the coolest of blues and the warmest of reds, so on and so forth. You basically want it to be really bright and really dark and show a wide variety of colors. Uh, that's exactly what HDR certification ensures you. So you are ensured at least 1000 nits of brightness along with several other parameters that let you see a photo that has everything like really dark shadows and really bright sun or something and like really vivid colors and really dull colors so that you can see stuff uh, as true to life as possible. Now let's move on to stuff like refresh rate. In the last few years we have seen several smartphone makers crank up their refresh rate all the way up to 144 hertz in some display panels. So like I said before, uh, the stuff that you watch on your smartphone isn't actually taking place in real life. It's a virtual form of something that has taken place in real life. So uh, similarly, the videos that you watch or anything that's moving on your screen isn't actually moving per se, it's just a bunch of pictures, moving pictures that are shown to you at a certain rate. That's why we call them movies coming from movie pictures. Now, if, if something is shown to you at 24, 25 FPS, you perceive it as moving. But if you take it all the way up to 60 FPS, the thing becomes smoother. And beyond that, things get even smoother. Now, a very closely linked thing to refresh rate is 
touch response rate or input response rate which basically means that your smartphone's processor is constantly asking your display if someone is touching it or not it's very similar to your finger and your brain if you're cooking something that's really hot your brain is constantly gonna ask your finger hey is something hot is something hot so that you don't burn yourself and if you extend that analogy to your smartphone display you get a really smooth swiping experience and that's something that really distinguishes smartphone displays from monitors and TVs because you don't touch them. That experience is extremely important in smartphones. Enough chitter chatter about displays, let's move on to internals. Now there's a reason why we don't talk about CPUs and GPUs separately in smartphones the way we do in let's say laptops and computers. Like there's no such thing as an NVIDIA GeForce graphics card for a smartphone. There's a reason for that. That's because we have a thing called SOC or a system on a chip. The SOC has several parts that are specialized for certain functions like image processing or Wi-Fi and you obviously have GPU and computing. Now the SOC is also linked to the memory and storage modules of your smartphone. In terms of memory, you have stuff like LPDDR4, LPDDR4X and even LPDDR5. What does that stand for? That basically stands for Low Power Double Data Rate Synchronous Dynamic Random Access Memory. <sighs> we need better naming. If you buy a generation of LPDDR memory, if it's of a lower generation, you're gonna get lower speeds at lower efficiency. On the flip side, if you're buying a higher generation, that is going to ensure you're going to get higher speed at higher power efficiency, but that is also going to be much more expensive. Next, we have UFS or Universal Flash Storage. Believe it or not, your smartphone's speed relies a lot on your storage as well. Now, traditionally, we have been using eMMC or Embedded Multimedia Cards, which have relatively lower data rates of about 2 Gbps and can only do stuff in one direction. So they can either read or write. UFS, on the other hand, UFS 2.1, has significantly higher data rates of about 5.9 Gbps and also can do things in both directions. So it can read and write as well. But UFS 3.0 is only used in high-end smartphones and even UFS 2.1 is used in smartphones that are relatively higher priced, so you won't find them in cheaper smartphones. Now let's move on to cameras. A lot of times you'll find stuff like shutter speed, apertures, f-stops, which can be confusing. This is not a camera specific video in any way, but I'm going to try and oversimplify this again. Now shutter speed is basically how fast your camera's shutter can close and open. It's denoted in a fraction of a second and the higher the denominator, the quicker your shutter is going to close and the vice versa. Now, having a slower shutter speed means that you're going to have higher brightness and also a higher amount of blur. But if you have a higher shutter speed, you're going to see lower brightness, but your images are going to be much more crisp. Coming to aperture, it is basically how wide your lens can open, which means you will have more light coming in, but at the same time, you'll have a lot of background blur, which depending on you and the kind of photo you want to click, may be good or bad. Now, aperture is denoted in f-stops. If you have a higher value, that means your aperture is smaller. And if you have a lower value, that means your aperture is bigger. Now, smartphones, unlike DSLRs have fixed aperture. So you won't be seeing aperture values changing or like hot swappable on your smartphone except a few smartphones like Samsung Galaxy S9 had a variable aperture, it had two apertures, but it's not a very common feature these days. Now let's talk about OIS and EIS. OIS or optical image stabilization is used in jerky settings while you're recording, let's say a video while walking. Now, this is done, this is achieved by using gyroscopes that are fitted directly inside a camera which moves it around physically to compensate for all the jerks that you're giving. Now, electronic image stabilization uses your phone's accelerometer along with some clever software trickery to give you a stable photo 
on video now by using EIS you're going to observe some sort of shimmering artifacts and your video is going to be a bit more cropped in so that is something that you should definitely consider when getting a phone that has EIS but there are certain phones like Google Pixel 4a for instance that uses both OIS and EIS in the form of hybrid setting to give you the best results possible. Now let's move on to the jargon that is related to the build quality of smartphones. You must have seen a lot of our videos, uh, you know, in which we spray smartphones to show you some sort of IP rating or P2I nano coating. What's that all about? So in a nutshell, you can protect a smartphone's internals from getting water damage in two ways, by introducing a physical barrier in the form of silicone seals. And the second one is basically by spraying it with a nano coating that repels water. Now, IP rating is basically a two digit rating system in which you get to know about an electronics dust and water resistance. So in this, you have two digits, the first and the second digit after IP. The first digit basically denotes the amount of dust resistance and the second digit denotes the amount of water or moisture resistance. Now, having an IP67 or 68 rating is ideal, but it only accounts for freshwater scenarios. If you have stuff like salt water or beer or anything else really going inside your smartphone, it may or may not work as intended. Now, talking about the second thing, P2I nano coating, that's basically a hydrophobic coating that is applied on your smartphone's internals or even your externals of your smartphone, like the bag or the display in order to keep water away what happens is if water enters your smartphone it may sit there on the components and short them that's not a very good thing if you apply these uh, nano coatings on the internals the water will actually roll away from the smartphone after a while instead of sitting inside and corroding the internals and that brings us to the end of this video. If you like this video, do not forget to hit like and share it with your friends as well if you learned something. Just remember that new elemental videos come out every Sunday at 1 p.m. So do not forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon like I said in the starting of this video. And for all things tech, log on to gadgets360.com.